Everyone, welcome to our virtual conference, Regenerative Organic Agriculture, what it's, what it's all about. Um, so with scientists, uh, estimates of only 60 years of topsoil remaining at current practices, uh, the need to have organic, regenerative, and fair trade practices incorporated into one standard was seen as essential by the Rodel Institute, who developed the Regenerative Organic Certified Program. So in this session, we'll delve into uh, the new ROC program, which was piloted in Canada by Nature's Path Food on Legend Organic Farm, which is associated with the company. We will discuss the merits of the program, yet also discuss consumer co confusion around the term regenerative, which is being used by um, non-organic businesses uh, currently. So to start with, I would like to introduce uh, Tia Lofsgaard, um, who is the Executive Director of the Canada Organic Trade Association, also known as COTA. Um, COTA is a member-based non-for-profit uh, involving the value chain of organic actors in Canada. Uh, Tia joined COTA in 2016. She also has a background um, in founding the first uh, fair trade organic brand in Canada, Camino Chocolate, and other roles within ethical certification landscape as the business development director for Fair Trade Canada and the uh, chief operating officer of Fair Trade America. Uh, Tia is currently a voting member of the organic Standards Technical Committee, the Organic Value Chain Roundtable, and COTA holds leadership positions on several committees and task forces that advance the organic sector market access and resolves regulatory burdens. And um, we have also with us today Sébastien Hull, uh, who is the general manager of Ecoser Canada. Uh, Sébastien has been involved in the last eight years in the organic sector. Uh, he's dedicated to work towards a sustainable world. Um, and he's, uh, and Ecoser uh, is recognized with nearly 30 years of uh, experience for audit and certification of organic products in more than 130 countries. Uh, ECOSA is the world's leading specialist in the certification of sustainable practices with more than 70,000 operators. ECOSA provides sustain suitable solutions to promote good environ environmental and societal practices across all sectors all over the world. And ECOSA was part of the 2019 pilot project for the Rodel Institute of the Regenerative Organic Certification. Uh, so without further ado, Tia and Sebastian, the floor is now yours. Right. Well, thanks very much for having us and presenting together. Uh, so Sebastian and I have combined our presentations, but I'm going to kick it off sort of setting the context for why there is a need. Uh, as was mentioned uh, in the opening statement, there's 60 years left of good topsoil if we don't start adapting our agricultural practices currently. So that is putting some fire under all of us to continue to look at ways to ensure that we're practicing good agricultural practices that are preserving our soil, etc. So just to kick it off, um, you know, right now, um, you know, besides the fact that we've got these soil issues, the future of food and farming is changing rapidly. We are seeing, this is a United Nations document actually that is talking about the climatic impacts and the impact it's going to have on food security um, for 9 billion people on this planet. So it's a increasingly important for us to look at the, the method of agriculture that we're using. Um, you know, every finished good product that is delicious and processed comes from the ground uh, in the first place. And so we need to really focus on soil and we need to focus on water. We need to focus on the environment, pollinator health, etc. So it is quite important for us to take into account the changing climatic line landscape that is um, dramatically altering uh, production of food and food security for um, all of us in the world. And I put a copy of this new film uh, that it was just released, I believe it was last week or the week before on Netflix. It's called Kiss the Ground and it really helps to kind of frame up this dialogue and some solutions because it's so difficult to always talk about how 
um, you know, climate change is here and we need to figure out ways to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change, etc. But when you watch this film, I feel like it, it's really a, a friendly way of saying, you know what, we are not without a solution. It, there are lots of things that we can and that people are doing in order to address climate change and soil health. So the organic sector is clearly uh, defined through uh, programs and regulatory oversight by the Canadian government. The two logos that you see on the screen are the most commonly known as organic certification. And sometimes I feel like people don't understand what's behind these logos. There is an entire standard which is dedicated towards soil health, biodiversity, uh, water, uh, water health and um, clean growing environments, non-GMO, um, and it, it's really important for us to understand all the components, including animal welfare, etc., that goes into these standards that are then audited by certification bodies like EcoCert um, and overseen by the federal government to ensure that you know, everybody's doing their job, even when it comes to the certification side of things. So we've seen a massive growth in this industry. Uh, organic, of course, has, in, has been around for a really long time, um, but not under a regulated system by the federal government. It was only in 2009 that um, the one standard for Canada Organic was established. This logo was trademarked by CFIA and that we have uh, started to formalize the programs around organic. That is not to say that organic hasn't been around for a long time, but just not with one set definition for our for for Canada. But we have now grown to a six point nine three six billion dollar industry, and you can see that we have now reached a three point two percent market share. So it is a huge growth market that is happening year over year. We are. Um, let me just move to the next screen. We are sixth largest consumer market in the world for organic. So if you combine us with the United States, which is the number one organic consumer market in the world, we make up 50% of overall consumption uh, in, in the world. And just to say that, um, you know, when, when they first started tracking who was getting certified, I think it was in 1986, there was something like 800, 800 um, certified operators. We're now over 7,000 certified businesses and farms across the country. And the amount of acreage that is certified in Canada is continuing to grow. We're now at 3% of total market share. So you can see that not only is there huge consumer demand, but that farmers are also responding to the opportunity and they're seeing that this is important for long-term uh, care of their soil and long-term care of their operations. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a history lesson, I won't go too far into this, but um, you know, even though we've only had a regulated system for the last many years, the concept of organic, um, these are the three real pioneers that kicked off defining what is organic. It started with Sir Albert Howard, where he went to India and he learned about uh, their farming techniques, which was in the Vedic Ind Indian scriptures. And he actually brought it back and that knowledge to North America, the United States. So he's considered the father of modern composting for his refinement of the traditional Indian composting system. And then he wrote a book, uh, which is the classic organic farming text. Picking up, up from there, in around the same time frame, you see Rudolf Steiner, who's the father of biodynamic agriculture. So he, um, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's um, kind of another technique that is used, but it's using, you know, mimicking nature essentially and, and working with uh, the components of nature to try and um, encourage its best possible uh, growth, growth uh, environment. And then to get onto Jer Jerome Irving Rodale, which we're going to go further into one of the programs that Rodale Institute is partnering on with the Regenerative Organic Standard, it was really the Rodale Institute that popularized the term organic. So, you know, there's been a lot of organic farming going on for a long time, but we didn't have a specific term or a specific definition. And when he uh, founded um, in 1930, he published the Organic Farming and Gardening magazine. And that's when we started to see uh, the term start taking off. And internationally, it was around the 1970s that we had the first uh, worldwide uh, standards for organic established by IFOM International. So just to get off uh, in regards to um, 
why it seems like all of a sudden everybody's waking up to the fact that we've got a climate crisis. There certainly uh, was a lot of press happening in the last uh, two years, really bringing this home that there is, um, there is a connection between human activity and the land and agriculture. And so certainly we can see that there's more focus even happening by our federal government, as well as more farmers uh, looking to ad adopt and innovate their practices uh, to try and do something about the fact that we've got global, global climate change happening and more people seem to be aware of it and the impact of human activity. So how is it that we can look at agriculture and the fact that the role that agriculture can play? Um, it's not even just agricultural practices, it's actually the creation of um, fertilizers and pesticides that have harmful components to them. Many of these items are mined in order to come up with the substances that goes into a fertilizer or a pesticide. So when we look at removing not only um, the fertilizers and pesticides that are made from synthetic or chemical in nature, uh, created more in manufactured states, not uh, mimicked by nature, we want to look at how that contributes towards healthy soil. If we remove these, these factors, um, uh, which the organic standards do prohibit GMOs and do prohibit a whole long list of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, the whole purpose of doing these specific strict rigorous standards is to ensure that we are doing everything we can to create healthy soil. And why? Because healthy soil has a huge amount of activity and life form happening within it. So micro life forms live within that soil. There's a nutrient factory that's happening for plant roots. There's a maxi storage facility for water, carbon and nutrients, and it acts as a super filter. So when we keep talking about carbon capture and needing to, to work on you know, carbon sequestration, et cetera, it is important to, to, to know that it can't be done all by itself. It needs healthy soil in order to help capture it. So um, this is where organic starts to look at where carbon can be captured. So here you can physically see soil that is not capturing carbon and there where it is. So it's quite a difference in regards to what's happening beneath the, the soil level on the forest side versus um, land that is becoming eroded. So top level organic, you know, when you look at the organic standards, of course, 99% of what organic standards offer is offering organic regenerative, but not always at the top level. And so this is important for our system to always be looking at how to continuously improve the organic standards. We've been in the process for the last year and a bit to revise the organic standards, which we're hoping will be published in November 2020 of this year. And we're ha happy to do more um, presentations on the exact changes, but it's, it's a continuous improvement for us to try and look at how to make all organic um, continuously regenerative. In, inherently, we, we have these elements in the standards that uh, are there entirely to protect the soil. And just to highlight that, you know, in organics, we don't permit hydroponics. It has to be grown in soil. It's a fundamentals of being involved in organics. Is, that is the purpose of what we're trying to do is restore and regenerate the soil. So what is the differences? Because regenerative is a term that we're hearing more and more and more these days. And we're seeing companies that use pesticides and GMOs saying that they're adopting regenerative practices. So this is where uh, we've started kind of looking at how to make it not so confusing for um, consumers and industry that are wondering what is regenerative when they are using you know, pesticides, et cetera. So we went through a bit of an exercise to look at the language that is associated with re the regenerative movement. And in organic, um, you know, we've been using the terms on the left. And the semantics have changed a little bit when it comes to regenerative, where people are talking more about carbon capture to prevent erosion, cover soil rotation of crops, and 
disturb less, you know, moving towards sort of a no-till situation. Well, in organic, um, we've always used terms like soil health, provide nutrition to soil life, green manures and rotation of crops and mimic nature. So really, um, you can see that organic has always had these components in it and we're really seeing some semantic changes, but um, not, not huge differences between. Now, we're gonna get into a presentation around a new standard that is called regenerative organic, um, which specifically says you have to already be base level of the, of the organic standard, and then they add on additional components. So that will be Sebastian speaking about that. But when it comes to the term regenerative that isn't associated with the regenerative organic certified program, which will be the next half of the presentation, we are a little concerned that if there's no actual definition of the term regenerative and there's a lot of you know organizations out there that are saying they're regenerative is this going to come off as more of a greenwashing and will consumers just be so confused that they'll buy it anyhow because it's um you know using the same kind of terms that um, organic is but it's not defined so we've really um started to think about how is it that we as an industry uh, of organic try to make sure that it's absolutely clear what is the organic promise within the organic standards and to help consumers to not be confused or get bored altogether just on saying oh what is this this is something something else that's new and i'm confused by it so we've actually gone through a bit of an exercise um, in the last many months with all of our experts just to really define if we're gonna use the term regenerative at all, that regenerative agriculture should include these elements. And so I'm just gonna run through some of our main points is that regenerative agriculture should be built on practices that do not rely on agrochemicals such as fossil fuel derived pesticides or fertilizers. It should be based on continuously adding and improving practices that regenerate soil health and carbon capture should be based on a holistic approach where we're looking at the total system's health and that it's valued over short-term gains. So we don't wanna you know, uh, put some pesticides or fertilizers on there, which essentially will hurt uh, the soil for a quick short-term yield increase. Now we wanna look at what's the long-term health of the system. Encompass a collection of practices balanced in such a way as to positively affect net soil health and carbon capture gains. Practices such as tillage should not be shunned completely, which it seems like there's an orientation right now by the regenerative um, group saying we need to go completely no-till, but we need to recognize that some forms of tilling has value in soil building and long-term carbon capture, so long as it's accompanied by practices that compensate for or neutralize any negative effects. So we don't wanna see tillage be completely um, demonized. Aim to achieve net gain capture and long-term capture of carbon in soil. So we don't wanna see just a, a quick gain and a quick release. We wanna see long-term capture of carbon in the soil. Also, when we're gonna measure uh, the carbon in the soil, we must test at least feet, at least three feet down because carbon in the upper four to eight inches can come and go. But it, what we really wanna see is longer-term storage that's happening below the surface. So at least go down three feet. And any meaningful regenerative agriculture or food and fiber labels or claims, they should be based off of a clear definition so that we know what it is that, um, that they're trying to achieve. Because anybody could use the term regenerative and there's not enough clarity in regards to what that means. Also in regards to claims uh, that if you're gonna be using regenerative agricultural practices without a clear definition, a standard and third party oversight and enforcement, it's no longer meaningful for consumers because they don't really understand what it is that you're seeking to achieve and it could introduce confusion and an unlevel playing field in the market. So those are just some of our quick points that we wanted to run through um, so that people are understanding that just the term regenerative without it being regenerative organic uh, lacks some clarity for consumers to know exactly what is, what is happening. And just to highlight that, you know, the whole goal I think that we, we have as an organic industry is to envision a world that is 
clean of poisonous chemicals and factory farming and exploitation and in income inequality. When we look at the work that we're doing, I think we do feel like we are social change agents and that we are all in this together to try and protect the long-term viability of farming and, and, and for our food supply. So we are always looking for what are the areas that we can continuously improve on. And this is where we have looked at, we several of our um, people as our membership of the Canada Organic Trade Association, we have actually been a part of the standard setting process uh, for the Regenerative Organic Alliance. And Sebastian's gonna go into the pilot project that first tested out the first standard and then wanted to make sure that any kinks that were in the system that needed to be addressed that that we actually could look at it. So just to highlight that uh, our association now formally does endorse this program as being an excellent option for uh, organizations that are looking to go above and beyond the baseline organic standards uh, in order for us to really look at um, even further further of the system where we can make improvements. So I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, hand over the mic now to Sebastian just to review the details of the Regenerative Organic Certified Program, which he's been involved in as the official uh, certifier uh, working with the Regenerative Organic Certified Standard. So, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Tia. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, Tia. Uh, so for everybody, I'm Sebastian, the General Manager of EcoCert Canada. Uh, the information I will provide today is to the best of my knowledge, as the regenerative organic uh, certification is pretty new, and it will, uh, it might, it may still evolve a little bit uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months. So uh, the information I'll give you is the current information I get now. Um, EcoCert Canada has four offices in Canada. Uh, Tia, if you can uh, switch, uh, yeah, I don't have the control of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, we have four offices in Canada, uh, Quebec, uh, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and we have uh, working with 120 employees. We have more than 4,500 4, clients here in Canada. Uh, and the group EcoCert, like uh, Beatrice said at the beginning, uh, is uh, uh, involved in 130 countries right now, working with 70,000 uh, clients. Our, our business uh, sector is uh, in the uh, food industries, mainly um, uh, with uh, organic and fair trade and food safety. But uh, we are all also uh, involved in 150 uh, different certification worldwide, such as uh, cosmetics, uh, like for the cosmos, the textile, the climate and forest, the environmental, and the sustainability development also. If we go into the uh, regenerative organic uh, standard, the ownership and management, um, how it's working. Um, the Regenerative Organic Alliance, the ROA, it oversees the ROC program. The ROA is a coalition of many organizations and is the owner of the standard and has developed the guidelines for the ROC certification. There's currently four approved certification bodies. So there's QAI, MyAsert, QCS, and EcoCert. Uh, so those are the four approved certification body in the world. How is the regenerative organic certified different from the Canadian organic certification? Um, the, the organic certification of Canada or the US are really the baseline for the ROC. And the ROC, like Tia said, is, is setting additional um, requirements and criteria to go a little bit beyond uh, in terms of the soil health, the animal welfare, and also the social fairness requirement. The regenerative organic is built on three pillars. So the pillars are the soil health, the animal welfare, and the social fairness. There is also three level of achievements uh, in that, uh, on those three pillars, uh, bronze, silver, and gold. And let's see a little bit more in detail each pillar in the next slide. The soil health pillar, um, as organic certification is the baseline, you can see that Canadian Organic or USDA or the EU or JAS are a pre-requirement for ROC certification. Uh, in fact, those uh, 
certification are the ground floor and the entry point for the rock certification. Criteria such as keeping as much of the ground covered in rooted vegetation as long as possible, rigorous crop rotation requirements, principle to minimize soil disturbance or tillage, and demonstration of a minimum numbers of regenerating practice are to be met. The animal welfare pillar. The, bas the baseline for this pillar is to have an animal welfare recognized certification such as certified humane, um, and that guarantee the freedom from discomfort, fear, hunger, injury, and normal behavior uh, for animals. The animals needs also to be grass fed, pasture raised, and concentrated animal feeding operations are another law. The third pillar is social fairness. With this pillar, it is important to address fair payments for farmers, good working conditions, establish long-term commitments, and for sure, forced labor is not allowed. The baseline, the baseline for this pillar is an approved fair trade certification, such as fair trade certify or fair trade, fair for life. You get a couple of logo here that are approved. And for North, North countries such as Canada or US or Germany, there is no baseline needed for that, uh, that fair trade uh, level, but there is social criteria that will need to be implemented and that it will be showed um, uh, to the uh, inspector to make sure that all the social requirements are met. The three level of the, the rock are for the bronze, to claim the rock at the bronze level. Um, for example, we need at least 25 persons of fiber or food producing land with, within the operation that must be certified at first and reach the silver level within five years. The claims about organic and regenerative organic can only be made about products specifically grown on land that is already certified organic. Any organic and regenerative organic labeling must also abide by USDA organic labeling regulation or core regulation or EU regulation or child regulation. In terms of the silver uh, level, to claim the rock at the silver level, we need at least 50% of fiber and food producing land to reach the gold level and reach the gold level within five years. And for the gold, we need to have 100% producing land and the operation must be certified. Who is eligible to that certification? So all non-exempt operation that handle rock claim product must be organic certified. The non-exec organization includes, but are not limited to, facilities that are preparing, mixing, packaging, uh, raw materials, so the primary processors, also future process or package certified goods, and store or transport certified product that is not enclosed or prepackaged for the entire duration of ownerships. Who is audited? So the operation requires to achieve a separate certification to rock are those that fulfill all of the following criteria. So need to take legal ownership of rock certified product, physically handle the rock certified product and make product claims about the rock. Processing facilities are not required to achieve separate certification to rock. However, non-exempt operation will be subject to a supply chain and brand licensee review to confirm the appropriate handling and segregation of products carrying a rock claim according to the requirement. So for rock gold level, at least one stage in the post producer supply chain must also be certified to rock. All those licensee and registration are handled by the ROA themselves. So let's talk a little bit about the pilot programs that uh, take place in 2019. So in total, there was um, seven country involved, four, certifi four certification body and 19 farmers and processors that participate in that pilot program. The project involved different companies. 
such as Nature's Path in Canada, for sure, like Tia said at the beginning, uh, Patagonia, Danon, Maple Hill, Horizon Organic, to name just a few. Those uh, products are the first regenerative organic products that are available on the market. So it's uh, an achievement of the pilot project uh, to have those products already uh, being able to be sold. And what was the return from the pilot project? So the experience of the pilot project served as the basic to finalize the framework for regenerative organic certified program. It took about seven months and uh, handled by the team board. And the result was a new framework uh, that was uh, uh, online, I think in June, but still under review for a couple of things uh, at this moment uh, right now. And if you are interested how you can apply, then you need to submit your initial application online uh, at, at the, uh, excuse me, at, at the uh, link uh, you see there. So that uh, at the regenerative organic uh, uh, excuse me, uh, regenerative organic uh, uh, website. And then you need to submit your regenerative organic system plan and choose your certification body. And note that registration and license will be also managed by the ROA. And that is pretty much for me for now. And I think uh, we can answer some questions if, uh, if any. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sebastian. Um, we can open the floor to uh, questions. Uh, so far, uh, you can all access the chat at the bottom of your screen and uh, ask any question to, uh, to Tia and uh, Sebastian. Uh, we have one question so far uh, from Jab. Um, it's a pretty uh, long question. Um, Tia and Sebastian, I don't know if you can also have access to the chat and read it also at the same time, uh, but I can start. So uh, Jab is mentioning that, um, he, he's mentioning about regenerative organic in, in the US and his question actually is for the social fairness aspect, did you do a benchmarking exercise between what ROC requires and or Canadian labor laws. So I don't think we have done that, but the regenerative organic has done that, uh, you know, to verify a little bit the, uh, the aspect of the, uh, the law. And this is why they are adding criteria that needs to be met, you know, so it's not just like, okay, you're under the Canadian law, you're okay. You need to prove that you are uh, really meeting the, all the social criteria um, that is required. I can add in on that. Um, so through our organic standards review in Canada, we have been talking a lot about the fact that the Canadian organic standards do not have anything related to fairness. And that's a key principle of organic. So, what we did was we formed a, a working group to look at our own standards, not the ROC standards, um, and said, you know what, because of what has happened um, uh, that you mentioned in the United States, it was important for us to actually look at how we can continuously improve our standard and bring fairness back into the baseline organic standard in Canada. So we had a limited amount of time in order to do the work, but um, we did include the fairness principle back into the standard. Um, it is something that is there under our principles again. Um, and of course, what we're planning on doing is working on this topic for the next, we, it takes five years every year to do every, every time to do the, the review, but all these questions you're asking in regards to Canadian labor laws, um, we would have to actually include everything around labor laws, not just in Canada. We would have to actually refer to the legislation of labor laws in every country because every product that's sold as organic in Canada needs to comply 
with our standards. So we can't have something that's specific to Canada. It would have to be the labor laws of every country. So um, as for the, the, uh, the, the fairness component and who they chose as their fair trade certification bodies that they recognized, um, I remember asking a question when they first were um, starting to launch this of why do they choose those specific fair trade programs? And the answer was that most of them were all members of ICEL, which is the International Social and Accreditation of Environmental Labeling. It's a very long acronym, but essentially that they all were pretty much ISO um, compliant and uh, part of the ICEL association. So they were reputable, had checks and balances, had third party oversight as a part of it, um, or very recognized, such as the, the World Fair Trade Organization, which does peer-to-peer -peer audits. So, Super. very long thank answer, you. sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another yeah, question yeah. from, uh, oh, you wanted yeah, to add something, Sebastian? Just one more thing in the chat sure. for the hydroponics. Uh, yeah, you're right, hydroponics is not uh, allowed in Canadian organic regulation and is allowed in the US and it's not allowed in the uh, ROC uh, certification. You're right. Super. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, another and, and last question so far. So um, people just feel free to, to write your question in the chat if you have any. Uh, a question from Judy Lamontagne, um, which is, as regenerative is very much about soil, how could uh, a slaughterhouse be uh, certified? Sebastian, you want to take that? Yeah, well, a little bit like I said, there's three pillars. There's the one of the soil, there's the one of the animal welfare, and the one of social and, uh, and fairness. And for a slaughterhouse, for sure, there's like traceability that needs to be, uh, you know, keep and everything. And there's also some additional criteria for a slaughterhouse to, uh, to, be, uh, to be met. Um, I, like, uh, Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I can come back uh, later about that. I, I have it on my uh, other uh, computer here, but there is some pre-slaughter requirements. Uh, the methods are also uh, uh, controlled and needs to be uh, specified. So everything to lower at the maximum the pain and the, uh, everything that can be uh, uh, not meeting the animal welfare in general. Yeah, and I, I think I'll just add on to say that, yeah, regenerative, a lot of focus is on soil, like with the mainstream groups that are using the term regenerative, but this is a program that has those three pillars. So it is, you know, the, the fairness is to be dealt with, with people, the, um, the, the, the animal welfare standards, that principle is to go towards uh, slaughterhouses and animals, and then the, the soil one is, of course, around soil. So there's three components, and I think that's why it's such a very interesting program because we've had all these different programs working in isolation. Now you've got them combined into one, which is really like gold standard, right? So it'll be very interesting to see how many companies could achieve uh, to be a part of the Regenerative Organic Certified because you do need to have the baseline certifications for either Certified Humane as one of the options or fair trade or the organic. You need to have all three. So if you're just getting started on your sustainability uh, framework, you would, you know, you might want to jump in and do all three at the same time and then also qualify for the regenerative organics certification. Super. Thank you. Um, so far, I think we, we don't have any additional uh, questions. Uh, so I guess I can um, close the uh, the conference by again thank you, thanking uh, Tia and Sebastian for your time with us today. Uh, thank you very much for your insight on the regenerative organic agriculture. Um, thank you, Tia. It's always a pleasure to have you as an expert with us at Cial um, as the organic expert. Um, and again, this uh, pre presentation will be uh, online on our YouTube uh, channel as well as in the replay uh, section on the virtual trade show uh, menu.
so again, thank you very much, both of you too, um, and wishing everybody very good, uh, very good day and visit on the virtual trade show, which goes on until this uh, Friday.